Good evening. Welcome to UT Brainstorms. My name is Mike Mock. I'm a professor in the Department of Neuroscience at UT Austin. This is uh, Brainstorms number 36. It's the 11th that we've done in this YouTube live format, and it's the end of our fourth season. So uh, special thanks to uh, our loyal uh, audience who have many of whom have come to almost all of these. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Uh, thank you also, as usual, to Laura and Ian and Elena Silva, who uh, do all the behind the scenes work that make Brainstorms work so smoothly. So Brainstorms is supported by the Department of Neuroscience at UT Austin. It's our way of sharing with you our passion and our expertise about neuroscience. Um, what's important is that we probably learn as much from your questions as you learn from our answers. And so it was always intended to be a conversation, uh, each of us helping the other. What this means then is, is that the most important part of each brainstorms really is the question and answer at the end. Uh, you would be able to do that here um, by typing in your questions in the YouTube live uh, uh, chat, and then we will uh, read them and answer them when the Q&A begins. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, uh, particularly a, a pleasure for me, uh, Dr. Amy Lee is one of our newest uh, professors at UT Austin. Uh, we, she, we recruited her away from a, another university and uh, it's very exciting for us and a great coup for us to be able to have recruited somebody of Dr. Lee's talent and, uh, and accomplishment. And she makes the Department of Neuroscience here at UT Austin just uh, that much stronger. Uh, as you'll see, she's an outstanding scientist and outstanding speaker, and uh, couldn't be more delighted to have her giving the final brainstorms for uh, the fourth season. So uh, to get things going then, please, uh, in this crazy virtual way, uh, help me somehow, some way, send positive vibes to welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Amy Lee. Thanks, Mike, for that really kind introduction. Um, it definitely has been a very challenging year, to say the least, uh, but one that I think really illustrates the importance of science in our society and that our mission as scientists is really to uh, make sense out of the biological mysteries that stand between us, our health, our livelihood and ultimately our future. Um, one of the big draws for me in terms of moving my lab to UT is the world-class uh, research that's being done here in many different departments. Um, as you'll hear uh, from later today, we have on the panel some scientists who participate in that endeavor, uh, really uh, trying to make fundamental discoveries into the molecules and mechanisms and therapies that allow us to uh, sense and respond to the world around us. So I'm thrilled to be here and um, I'll, I hope that I'll be able to share with you my uh, screen, which um, I'm going to do right now. All right. Um, so uh, the panelists today uh, that I alluded to are Drs. Uh, Nace Golding, Eric Senning, and Spencer Smith, um, who will uh, chime in at the end for the Q&A. And so uh, please reserve plenty of questions, I hope, uh, for later at the end of the talk. Okay, so um, my lab is focused on, uh, on the activity of ion channels, which I'll talk about today, uh, but a, a major research focus of ours is in the sensory systems, such as in the retina and also in the ear. Uh, what I'm going to focus on is a former research interest actually in uh, auditory function, uh, which we were heavily engaged in at the University of Iowa. Um, 
a, a very important place for uh, the study of a lot of the topics I'll talk about today. Um, so why should we study he hearing and deafness? Um, this is really an important uh, sense for our ability to communicate with each other as human beings, but also uh, from a biological perspective in the animal world. Uh, animals such as dolphins, birds, bats, all use vocalizations to communicate with each other and have developed very sophisticated ways of doing so that rely on a profound sense of hearing. Um, the development of language also in humans is critical uh, it, it relies critically on our sense of hearing, as I'll discuss later. Um, how does the ear process sound and, and how does it get disrupted in deafness is also a, uh, an interesting question that I'll address. And there are many different approaches being used uh, today to address this question in a variety of different experimental systems. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll cover what the uh, current state of the art is in terms of therapies for hearing loss. Uh, it is an exciting time in this area because there are uh, approaches involving the manipulation of gene expression to correct genes that have been uh, altered during development and causing deafness, as well as ways to restore the cell types that are important for hearing um, using a variety of cell-based approaches. And so these are the three major uh, topics that I'll address today in, in my talk. Okay, so uh, hearing loss is a major public health concern and, and continues to be so. It's the third most common uh, chronic condition uh, behind arthritis and another major public health concern, heart disease. By 2050, uh, about 2.5 billion people are estimated to uh, will be suffering from uh, per, uh, permanent hearing loss. Um, and a billion young people in particular will be faced with permanent uh, avoidable hearing loss due to uh, noise exposure. Hearing loss in the United States affects about 16% of the adults and thanks to uh, really major advances in newborn screening efforts where in the US now 98% of all babies are screened for hearing loss. Uh, one in of those 500 children are, that are tested are actually born with some cause, one, some case of hearing uh, loss. Um, the prevalence increases with age, as some of us have already experienced, um, about 50%, 25 to 50% of people over the age of 75 will have some form of hearing loss. And unfortunately, it only gets worse from there. Uh, at uh, people over the age of 85, uh, most of them will experience uh, hearing loss of some sort or the other. Um, so this is, continues to be a major public health condition and one that warrants further research. As I mentioned, there are a number of adverse consequences to uh, hearing impairment in children. It's been shown uh, that hearing impairment not only affects the development of language, but also uh, reduces uh, academic achievement and uh, social skill development. Uh, causing isolation and uh, other consequences related to that. Among the elderly, as uh, you can imagine, uh, hearing impairment is associated with social isolation that can then lead to things uh, like cognitive decline and dementia. Um, it's been estimated that for those over 60 years of age that experience or that are diagnosed with dementia, over a third of those cases uh, are linked to hearing loss. Um, thus, it is really critical uh, as the aging population continues to increase in the United States that we begin to develop an understanding of, of what causes uh, and how to treat uh, hearing impairment as a consequence of aging. Um, I also have a personal reason for studying hearing and hearing loss, um, and that's related to my family. Um, 
you may have heard the music at the beginning of the talk. Uh, it was the Bach cello suites performed by my husband, Mark Burnett, who made recordings of this on double bass. Um, and my daughter is also a double bassist. They play instruments that take advantage of um, our low frequency hearing, um, whereas my son, David Burnett, is a violinist. Um, and he uh, plays an instrument that exploits our high frequency um, range of hearing. So for me, not only do I have a scientific interest in the molecules that regulate our sense of hearing, but I also have a, a personal investment in that um, music and sounds are the way we communicate in our household, as, as uh, many others do. Okay. Um, to begin, I'm just going to take you through just how the ear processes information. Um, if you have questions about higher order processing, what happens when the sound information leaves the ear and goes on into the brain, please reserve those for Dr. Smith and Golding who have uh, far more expertise in that area than I do. Um, but uh, just to take you through the initial uh, phases of, of sound processing in the ear. I'm going to show you a video accompanied uh, by sound, which I hope will play. Okay, so when sound enters our ear, it's all about mechanical stimulation. So the ear collects these sound waves, uh, which then cause the vibration of our eardrum in a way that is related to the frequency of sound information. Um, this then in turn is transmitted to the middle ear, to the bones there, the malleus, incus, and stapes, which also uh, move in a way that uh, stimulates the cochlea, a fluid-filled structure that has many specialized elements for hearing, including an endolymph or fluid that's unusual in composition and it ripples with the sound waves causing the specialized sound receptors the hair cells uh, to uh, move they have hairs at the top of their cells that move in relation to the vibration of the endolymph that in turn causes activation and opening of these tiny pores in the membrane called ion channels and these channels conduct ions that then activate the hair cell so that it releases a neurotransmitter called glutamate that then activates the auditory nerve, which carries this information on into the brain. Now the cochlea is itself specialized for uh, different frequency sound encoding, such that, that the bass is uh, specialized for high frequency pitches, such as a piccolo, whereas the middle of the cochlea it's specialized for uh, mid-frequency sounds, such as a viola. The apex then is specialized for the low-frequency double bass-like sounds uh, that you heard at the beginning of the talk. And so these all come together in terms of orchestrating the sound that we then interpret in our brain. Uh, in this case, Beethoven Ninth Symphony. So it's really a remarkable process and of engineering and design within the ear that has really captured the attention of, of many neuroscientists in addition to myself. Okay, so back to the mechanisms that allow the ear to, um, to perform in a way that I just mentioned. Um, so what are these components that allow the hair cells to actually convert this uh, mechanical information of sound waves entering the ear into a chemical signal? It first starts with the hair bundles and a molecule that's now known as the mechanoelectrical transduction channel. So this is a channel within those hairs atop the hair cells that uh, are able to open and close in response to force. The hairs on the hair cells have a protonaceous link between the hairs called a tip link. And this is a 
causes each of the hairs to uh, pull on each other in a way that increases the tension of the membrane, uh, causing the, these channels to open and allow ions such as potassium and calcium into the hair cell to then activate a um, signal that excites the membrane potential of the hair cell. This in turn causes uh, at the release of the neurotransmitters that then uh, activate the auditory nerve. Our area of interest in the hair cell is right at the base. And this is in the context of another ion channel, but one that is specialized for letting calcium into the cell. So these calcium channels are localized at very specialized structures, which you brainstormers probably have heard of before. And that is a synapse, a junction between a one nerve cell and the other. Um, so at these synapses, these calcium channels sense the accumulation of positive charge within the hair cell uh, and open, allowing calcium to enter the cell where it is able to, where all the calcium ions are able to bind to specialized uh, proteins on, on vesicles that contain the neurochemical glutamate. Um, this calcium then uh, causes the fusion of these uh, vesicles with the plasma membrane that allows the glutamate to spill out of the hair cell such that it can bind to another uh, ion channel, this time on the auditory nerve fibers uh, that is gated by the glutamate binding to the channel. And when the glutamate binds to the channel, it allows sodium ions to flow into the auditory nerve fibers, which is the call to action um, to signify that uh, to the brain via all of these fibers in the auditory nerve, um, the sound information that started all the way um, out with the opening of the mechanoelectrically gated channels in the hair bundles. So now I'm going to tell you uh, a story of how uh, scientists discovered the molecular nature of the mechanoelectrical transduction channel. I like to tell this story because I think it really illustrates uh, the pathways that scientists can take in terms of following where the data takes you um, and, and utilizing all the techniques available to do so. Uh, so uh, one of the techniques is to uh, is a technique that we use in our lab um, and also um, Dr. Senning uses in his lamp to characterize the uh, functional properties of ion channels, um, and that is a, a patch clamp recording. So if you were able to put an electrode on the hair cell and then use a, a fluid jet to stimulate the movement of the hair bundles, uh, you would see this type of deflection, this down word trace, which represents the influx of those uh, positive ions into the cell. So in this way, by putting on um, uh, stimuli of different uh, pressures, you can measure and characterize the properties of the current. And, and so because people, investigators were able to detect these mechanically gated channels, they assumed that this was a protein that could be activated uh, by such stimuli. Um, Second, in addition to electrophysiology, there have been a number of labs that have used model animal organisms in order to study the process of mechanoelectrical transduction. Um, these include mice, uh, which uh, have been very uh, used very successfully to identify genes that have been involved in mechanotransduction, zebrafish, uh, and uh, uh, also studies of uh, human genetics of deafness. So uh, as I will tell you in a minute, looking at patient data in terms of the patients who present with certain forms of deafness and analyzing their genes and the sequences that are uh, altered in those patients, trying to figure out uh, what is causing their uh, hearing loss has led to the identification of numerous genes uh, that are important for inner ear function. So this process of identifying the mechanical, uh, the, the MET channel uh, for short, uh, took over 50 years. Uh, and I think it's a real tribute to uh, the labs of doctors David Corey and Jeff Holt at Harvard University, who uh, really were on the hunt 
to characterize this molecule so that we could better understand uh, the function and dysfunction of hair cells. Um, so it started in 1958 when uh, Dale and Kosher identified a mouse mutant that appeared to show signs of hearing impairment. Uh, one of the signs you might ask, how do we detect deafness in mice? Well, one of uh, the clear signs that you can observe uh, in a laboratory mouse is that they circle. Um, they run around in circles, and this is because part of the ear uh, the, has hair cells that regulate our sense of balance. Um, and so a circling behavior in mice is often used as a sign that that mouse may have some genetic alteration that's linked to hearing impairment. It wasn't, however, until 1980 when investigators did electrophysiological recordings to show that these mice were indeed insensitive to sound information. And then not until 1995, when uh, with the advent of, of genetic sequ sequencing techniques, investigators were able to identify the part of the human genome that caused deafness in a certain um, population of patients that uh, incidentally was uh, identified um, as the equivalent as the equivalent gene in humans as what was mutated in this original DN mutant mouse. Um, and this in fact was turned out to be the TMC1, the gene encoding um, something called TMC1, which uh, seemed to be unlike any other, uh, any ion channel uh, known at that time. So it's not really considered to be important for ion channel function. Uh, a side trip was taken by um, David Corey and Jeff Holt, who ultimately identified uh, the actual channel that was the MET channel. Um, they reasoned that uh, there was a channel called Trip A1, which had previously been shown to be sensitive to mechanical stimuli, as well as thermal and chemical stimuli. Um, so with a variety of approaches, they were able to come to the conclusion that this trip A1 seemed to be a pretty good candidate. It was sensitive to mechanical stimulation and it seemed to be uh, localized in hair cells uh, among other lines of evidence. Um, however, a couple of years later uh, with the accumulation of another data set, they concluded that trip A1 contributes to the sensation of cold uh, and chemical um, chemicals, but not uh, to, but is not critical for hair cell uh, mechanoelectrical transduction. Um, so I think that's a really important point that we pretty much use the data that support our hypothesis at one point in time, but in fact, the goal of science is to keep probing. And uh, so it is not too surprising that their interpretation uh, changed at a later time. Um, but then uh, in, within the last few years, the same group identified uh, the TMC1 gene uh, that, was uh, that was initially hinted at so many years ago as being really the critical uh, element that comprised that, that, when, that encodes the uh, pore forming subunit of the hair bundle mechanosensory transduction channel, a real accomplishment and major step forward uh, for the, the field. It's since been shown that there are a number of mutations in the TMC1 gene that encodes this channel that lead to inherited forms of deafness. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, many of the uh, genes that are encoding, uh, many of the genes that uh, are known to uh, be mutated in various forms of deafness affect the process that I just described within the cochlea. Um, and that is they can affect the ability of hair bundles to sense and respond to mechanical stimuli such as TMC1. They can affect synaptic transmission by the hair cells. Uh, so our contribution is the identification of this calcium channel regulatory protein, CABP2, which uh, we found in collaboration
invitation with Guy van Kamp at, uh, in Belgium to be uh, associated with a moderate to severe form of hearing loss. And then there are uh, genes that are implicated in the ability of the hair cell to function, such as KCNQ4, which is a potassium channel that is thought to be important for potassium recycling and, and perhaps contributing to um, the high concentration of potassium that happens to be in the endolymphatic fluid that is uh, critical uh, for the hair bundles to uh, function. So in addition to uh, genetic mutations leading to hearing loss, there are uh, a variety of other sources. Drugs uh, such as antibiotics, uh, aspirin, anti-cancer agents can all cause damage to hair bundles atop the uh, hair cells and lead to hearing, severe hearing loss in humans. Uh, viruses, uh, also a cytomegalovirus is a common case of, a uh, common cause of deafness in babies. Um, aging, age-related hearing loss is known as presbycusis, and um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, diseases such as di diabetes is highly correlated with impaired function of the auditory nerve. Um, and then noise, uh, which we all appreciate uh, can have adverse effects on our hearing, but I hope I'll impress on you today uh, to that we should really try to limit our exposure um, for the future. So why is noise, uh, how, is can how bad can noise affect our how badly can noise affect our hearing? Um, this is uh, the uh, a range of sounds uh, and their intensity expressed in decibels. So uh, the higher the decibel unit, the louder uh, sounding the sound actually is. Um, so one sound that is we are immediate the that is can acutely endanger our hearing um, is like a jet engine at takeoff or a gunshot. Um, we may know some people uh, who enjoy shooting at the shooting range uh, who experience tinnitus as a consequence of this hobby. Um, and that could be due to the fact that their hearing has been permanently impaired um, and a number of changes have taken place in their auditory system that lead to this ringing in the ears known as tinnitus. Um, so it's important to protect your ears from uh, noises that are this loud. Um, rock concerts uh, can cause hearing damage within uh, seconds um, when, when the sounds are as loud as 120 decibel. And in fact, there are a number of uh, performers, uh, maybe some of the more experienced of us will uh, recognize these performers uh, who play rock music uh, and have for many years and, uh, and are currently experiencing uh, severe hearing loss, perhaps as a consequence of their vocation. Um, a timely reminder that uh, fire uh, crackers are very loud, uh, 125 dB, and that even a, a moderate exposure in terms of time to the sound of fireworks going off when at close range uh, can really affect our hearing. Um, <laughs> Here in Texas, as we were in Iowa, we have many, many football fans. And uh, I'm, I've heard that the uh, UT uh, football stadium is one of the largest. Uh, so I can imagine that when cheers erupt for our, the Longhorns, that um, it can be very loud. Uh, I'm pointing out here that one of the loudest, one of the world's records for loud cheers was in 2014, uh, where the it was a sound meter was able to detect that uh, the cheers got as loud as 140 uh, decibel, which certainly is in that range uh, that a number of people that appreciated the game that day are likely to now be experiencing um, some uh, damage to their inner ear. 
And this is an example, uh, kind of a dramatic example taken from an animal study of what can happen to the ear uh, after exposure to sustained uh, hearing loss. Um, this is an animal, uh, this is a, a, a picture, an image taken by electron microscopy of the cochlea epithelium uh, showing the uh, outer what, hair cells that are important for sound amplification and the inner hair cells. Um, what you can see are nice rows of hair bundles all aligned um, in a tonotapic fashion if you were to unroll the cochlea. Um, an animal that has been exposed for hours to a very loud sound, uh, you can see has a very different looking cochlea uh, with very few outer hair cells left and inner hair cells that have hair bundles that are splayed downward, indicating a permanent uh, or very uh, significant damage. And, and one can appreciate from what I told you initially that this morphology of the hair bundles uh, would be quite detrimental to the ability of the mechanoelectrical uh, transduction channels to be able to sense force. Uh, and so it's, it's pretty clear uh, from how these hair cells look, uh, what the nature of what the mechanism might be that leads to hearing loss in those that sustain um, very severe uh, noise damage to their ear. So noise and also a natural process of aging seems to affect uh, initially our high frequency range of hearing. Um, so when we're born, we have uh, a, a range of hearing from let's say 20 Hertz to about 24,000 Hertz. Um, but as we uh, become more experienced, uh, we have, we lose some of this high frequency range. So uh, someone like our esteemed uh, Dr. Malk would have, let's say a, a range of hearing from 20 Hertz to 16 kilohertz uh, lacking in those extremely high frequency ranges that we enjoyed when we were children. Um, as we age even further, uh, we would lose even more high frequency capability. Um, so someone like uh, this person uh, may have even less of a high frequency um, encoding capability in their cochlea, uh, which may or may not explain um, some of their policies. Uh, but just for fun, uh, this is a little uh, more um, informative in person, but I'm just going to play you a um, animation that will uh, kind of uh, like you to just silently raise your hand to yourself uh, to identify the frequency at which you start to be able uh, to hear the sound. Um, uh, those of us who are a little older will be able to hear some of the later sounds, uh, whereas those of us who are on the younger side will be able to hear some of the earlier um, high frequency sounds that are mentioned. 22 kilohertz, 21k. 20K, 19K, 18K, 17K, 16K, 15K, 14K, 13K, 12K, 11K, 10K, 9K, 8 kilohertz. Okay, so I was able to hear my uh, the sound around 13 kilohertz, um, well within the range of, I'm sure, uh, my colleague, Dr. Mao. Um, but that just kind of gives you an indication of how um, many of us will vary in the, the range of frequencies that we can actually detect. Hearing loss, as I mentioned, uh, can be highly heterogeneous in its origin. And, and, and in many cases, it's the combination of genetics uh, with environmental conditions that can ultimately determine the progression of one's uh, hearing. Um, so the way we detect, uh, many of us have gone to uh, 
our physician and had a hearing test, um, if not earlier in our lives in school. And this involves putting on headphones and uh, you are subjected to tones of different intensity or decibel. And our threshold is considered um, the minimum uh, intensity that we're able to hear. Um, auditory brainstem responses are another uh, way to measure this, uh, which involves slightly different um, technology. Um, so our normal hearing uh, threshold would be between zero and 20 decibel. Uh, moderate to mild hearing loss would be another 20 decibel. And then profound hearing loss would be that you could only hear sounds of 100 decibel or higher. Um, it's been shown through studies of animal models of deafness, as well as human postmortem samples, that hearing loss often involves morphologic changes in and structural changes in the cochlea, uh, namely the loss of the hair cells or and, and or the auditory nerves that connect to them such that profound hearing loss uh, looks maybe very similar to what I showed you in the noise damaged animal that uh, there, is, uh, there are very few hair cells uh, that are remaining in certain parts of the cochlea. There are a number of exciting developments in terms of ways that we can approach correcting deficits in hearing. Um, one being the use of stem cells, which normally are, uh, can be um, differentiate, subjected to uh, genetic manipulations and can be turned into, transformed into different types of cell types. Investigators have identified ways to reprogram these generic stem cells into otic progenitor cells that can then uh, be further manipulated to become hair cell-like uh, structures, which um, when they're grown further in a dish can become a three-dimensional organoid that then can be transplanted into the damaged cochlea with the hope that those hair cells will repopulate areas that have been damaged due to noise or age-related uh, consequences um, and there is some evidence in animal models that this is a promising approach, but it's not yet employed in humans. Um, another approach uh, takes advantage of viruses, which in this case can be manipulated so that they express a particular uh, gene product that either may be defective, um, thus leading to an inherited form of hearing loss, or uh, it can um, be used to express uh, substances that uh, promote the regrowth of the auditory nerves, which may have become damaged due to noise as well. Uh, one of the uh, consequences of hair cells being lost is that they um, normally provide some trophic factors or support growth support for the auditory nerve. So when the hair cells degenerate, so does the auditory nerve. And this is really an important deficit because cochlear implants take rely on the uh, integrity of the auditory nerve in order to reproduce uh, hearing per, uh, the hearing perception uh, that normally would be uh, encoded by the hair cells communicating with the auditory nerve. Um, this viral based strategy has been FDA approved for certain vision impairments, but it's not yet uh, to that stage for hearing impairment. Um, although there are a number of animal studies suggesting uh, that this will be a viable method uh, sometime in the future. The gold standard for improving hearing in uh, impaired populations is really the success story in sensory neuroscience and uh, prosthetic devices. And, and those are the hearing aids and cochlear implants, which are not interchangeable. They're in fact quite different in how they work. Um, hearing aids are um, 
can be used for what we term conductive uh, hearing loss, which is uh, the ability, which results from um, inability of sound to be communicated from the outer to the uh, inner ear, um, or uh, it can be sensory neural in nature, meaning uh, defects to the hair cells or the auditory nerve fibers. Um, Cochlear implants, on the other hand, are only used to treat sensory neural hearing loss uh, and rely on uh, the auditory nerve uh, to be intact in order to stimulate it. Uh, hearing aids are used to amplify sounds, so they're very much like turning up the volume dial on a radio, um, whereas cochlear implants simply use electrical signals to simulate the normal activity of the hair cells that they would experience in, re in response to sounds. And they, uh, these, um, this electrical signal is used to stimulate the auditory nerve fibers to mimic what the hair cells would normally communicate to them. And then this code is transmitted then into the brain because the auditory fibers project to parts of the brain and then higher up into our uh, forebrain that allows us then to uh, perceive these sounds. Hearing aids, we can take in and out, but cochlear implants need to be put in by a surgeon. Uh, and finally, the cost is quite different. So a few thousand dollars for hearing aids, um, but again, uh, very expensive because of the surgery uh, and technology that's involved in terms of, of cochlear implantation. Cochlear implants are, uh, have been really successful for, for um, endowing patients with hearing perception that were born deaf and for restoring hearing perception in older people who are hearing impaired. So the way these works is, is that the, the sounds from our environment are picked up by a microphone in the cochlear implant that's on the outside of the head and then this, uh, this, um, the electronics in this device convert that signal into an electrical uh, impulses that then are transmitted through the skull and into, uh, the, uh, into the electrode that is uh, implanted within the cochlear spiral. Um, this then causes the stimulation of the auditory nerve in a way that simulates what came into the ear in terms of uh, the sound wave evoked signals. When implanted, when diagnosed early, and this is the importance of identifying hearing impairment in the younger individuals, um, one can almost completely bypass the developmental delay in language uh, acquisition uh, that is normally associated with hearing impaired. And so here is an example of a boy who was born deaf, uh, but clearly can speak and in response to his mother, um, as well as any other- Tell me a little bit young, about your meatball story. Young person. So um, he's five. I don't really know it. What do you mean don't really know it? I know some of the words. Okay, well just tell me a little you know, bit about it. Just... Um... So the first, what is the first page? Um... I have a meatball. Yeah, and Whoa. inside the book does it... What does it show inside the book? Pictures? Pictures of you doing what? So you can see that he's just like any other kid. Um, able to speak uh, and probably interact with his peers, um, really uh, made possible by this cochlear implant, which he received uh, when he was very young, um, thus highlighting the importance of uh, intervention at a stage uh, when uh, the child will most benefit from it in terms of his development. There are some limitations, however, and, and many people are surprised that uh, cochlear implants don't exactly reproduce what we would normally hear. Um, and this is particularly evident in terms of music perception, uh, which uh, you can appreciate with this audio clip. So here is a clip of, uh, oops. 
that uh, of a, a Beethoven sonata that most of us can appreciate. Um, So the same music uh, through uh, encoded by a cochlear implant uh, may sound like this. So very different um, and really illustrating um, that there are challenges that still need to be overcome in terms of uh, the ability of cochlear implants to reproduce that uh, richness of sound um, that we can appreciate with our acoustic hearing capability. Uh, what are some of the uh, factors that limit cochlear implant performance? Um, well, one factor that you can appreciate by just looking at the cochlear implant electrode, which is about uh, 10 millimeters uh, long is that uh, it, when it's inserted into the cochlear spiral, uh, you can see that it's probably going to do a lot of damage. Uh, and in fact, when these electrodes are implanted, they do, uh, depending on the surgeon, um, but inevitably cause uh, quite a bit of damage to both the hair cells and the auditory nerve fibers. Uh, that in itself uh, causes further degeneration that can lead to the loss of any residual hearing. Uh, let's say uh, an individual is lacking um, function primarily in their uh, high frequency region. Um, if their low frequency region in, in the apex is intact, um, they may lose some of that residual hearing due to damage caused by the implant electrode. Um, and also the fact that some of these uh, neural structures are damaged, it uh, necessarily implies that uh, you need larger electrical currents uh, in order to stimulate the residual auditory nerve fibers. Um, so to overcome some of those challenges, uh, my very uh, good colleague uh, at the um, University of Iowa, Dr. Bruce Gantz, among many others on his team and at other institutions have developed a hybrid cochlear implant that has a shorter electrode. Um, compared to the standard one. And this is meant uh, to be used in combination with a hearing aid-like device um, that can then be used to amplify hearing in the part of the cochlea that is uh, not damaged in, in certain patients. And, and that would be in the apical region, the lower frequency range. Um, so the hybrid implant is a shorter electrode. It goes into uh, the base uh, of the cochlea and provides stimulation to the auditory nerve fibers that are dysfunctional there. But it does also have a, an acoustic amplification device, much like a hearing aid, that would then provide function to the lower frequency spared regions. And uh, in collaboration with Kate Gefeller's group, um, Dr. Gantz's uh, group, uh, did many studies of patients that have these cochlear implants, these hybrid implants, and, and tested whether their appreciation of music was better. So they uh, compared patients with standard cochlear implants with those who have hybrid implants and normal hearing and a population that was uh, of normal hearing. Um, and they subjected them to music with lyrics or no lyrics, and then a, a survey that would determine how the accuracy which, uh, which they were able to hear aspects of that music. And so you can see here that the standard implant, uh, cochlear implant uh, patients have uh, very poor performance compared to those with the hybrid implants who were really no different from the hearing individuals in terms of their ability to perceive uh, the, the music. And uh, it's interesting to note that in this study, the hybrid group compared uh, most favorably uh, to the normal hearing group within uh, when asked questions about a low frequency range um, type of instruments such as a trombone, cello, um, or a double bass. 
Uh, so again, those were patients who probably had residual low frequency hearing that then was spared and, and perhaps enhanced by the hybrid nature of the cochlear implant. So another strategy that is being used to um, overcome some of the uh, limitations of cochlear implants uh, is to somehow reduce the need to ha uh, have cochlear implants uh, using high electrical currents. Um, and so this schematic is, I'm gonna use just to kind of explain that concept. I mentioned that when a cochlear implant goes into the cochlea, a lot of the hair cells are disrupted and this causes secondary damage to the fibers that would normally innervate those hair cells. So uh, there ends up being a gap between the auditory nerve fibers and then the cochlear implant electrode. Uh, and this is uh, a problem because uh, not only would you need to use fairly high current levels in order to reach the auditory uh, nerve fibers, but you also lose the ability to stimulate particular frequencies, uh, neuro nerve cells that encode particular frequencies so that you lose some of the uh, richness of music or the details in speech. Um, as an illustration of that concept, um, I'm just gonna play you what happens when you have reduced the number of effective frequency channels that a cochlear implant would allow. So this is, let's say, if you had one channel, um, some speech, two channels, you're able to have four channels, the wife helped her husband, eight channels, the wife helped her husband, the wife helped her husband. Okay, so you can see when you increase the number of channels that are operable with a, uh, a cochlear implant, you get much closer to what we would hear with our acoustic hearing. The same is true for music perception. Um, so if you had a very limited number of uh, channels, you would have something like this. As you increase, you can sort of detect and alterations there. Here you're starting to detect the distance. And here is, sorry. Um, well, the last one was the last, uh, uh, audio clip was supposed to give you the full on um, Rhapsody in Blue <laughs> played on the clarinet. Um, but uh, the point is that one would like to be able to increase how many um, frequencies could be encoded and um, by the cochlear implant stimulation of the auditory nerve. So what are the ways that we can do that? One is to enhance the, uh, close the gap essentially promote the growth of the auditory nerve fibers back towards the implant. So how do we do that? Um, well, and why would that be effective? Well, if we were able to have all the fibers contacting their individual, the individual um, channels that are of the cochlear implant, one could encode more of the normal frequency range of hearing uh, leading to very specific activation of particular auditory nerve fibers. Um, and so one of the reason, one of the uh, areas of uh, continuing research in my lab is in collaboration with Alan Guyman and Marlon Hansen at the University of Iowa. Alan's a, an engineer um, who has generated these uh, photopolymerized substrates with varying properties uh, that we've been studying in terms of their ability to promote growth of these uh, nerve fibers in a directional manner. Um, Dr. Hansen uh, is an otolaryngologist who ha has made many improvements to cochlear implant technology and his lab um, and ours are working together in terms of identifying the signaling pathways within these nerve fibers that allow them to grow uh, 
within in response to these physical uh, parameters of these substrates. And hopefully uh, we can use those in a way or that knowledge in a way that we can develop uh, biomaterials that then could be used in conjunction with cochlear implants uh, to uh, close the gap between the nerve fibers and uh, the cochlear implant electrode. Finally, I just want to uh, discuss a topic that is relatively new in auditory neuroscience, and that is hidden hearing loss. Uh, this it can be uh, it, it, the basis of what it, we have all known is the cocktail, cocktail party effect. Um, the idea that we can hear uh, conversations really well in let's say my office here, um, but when we're in a crowded bar uh, or a party situation, it becomes very difficult to distinguish what somebody is saying to you. Um, so what is the cause of that? And, and is this, and how um, have we been able to study it? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, there are various ranges of intensity of sounds that can cause hearing damage. And, and one um, that has really become a public health concern is originating from our use of uh, our iPhones and uh, earbuds. And this is especially a problem among the younger population uh, that use uh, earbuds all the time for uh, hearing their music through their iPhone or carrying on conversations. In this pandemic, we've all been using earphones uh, more than we would like. Uh, but what we've come to appreciate is that this sustained exposure to even moderate levels of sound uh, can lead to uh, hearing loss later on in life. And uh, this was studied uh, in many animal systems uh, by Charles Lieberman and Sharon Kujawa at uh, Harvard Medical School among others. Um, and this study that recently um, uh, came out really validated a lot of their work in animal systems. Uh, so they, hypothesize that um, sustained use of or, or unsafe listening practices with earbuds and, and um, music playing device, music playing devices would lead to hearing loss in uh, young people. And so uh, they did hearing tests in uh, low risk population, those who didn't profess to practice unsafe listening and those at higher risk who routinely went to um, rock concerts or, or used um, their iPods uh, excessively. Uh, so what they found was that these individuals experienced uh, pretty significant um, high frequency hearing loss. Although in the range that is normally tested in individuals in terms of whenever you go into the physician's office to take a hearing test for, to about eight kilohertz, they were no different than uh, those who were at low risk. Um, so it's really only in this high frequency range that uh, this hearing loss was discovered. Uh, moreover, and perhaps more significantly, uh, they, these individuals reported difficulties hearing sounds when they were in the context of noise. Uh, and so this indicated that there are probably a lot of individuals out there who have otherwise normal audiograms, except maybe in the high frequency range that's never tested, um, and yet have this uh, nascent hearing loss that they report in a, in a behavioral sense. And, uh, Kujawa and Lieberman then went on to show that uh, in animal models, that what is happening in these individuals is um, likely a consequence of loss of the synaptic connections between the hair cells and the auditory nerve fibers. So this is a uh, fluorescent image of a, an animal cochlea that uh, has been labeled so that the individual synapses are fluorescent, 
Um, so you, these dots rep represent the connections to the auditory nerve fibers. Uh, and you can see that in, in a noise exposed, uh, and this is moderate noise, this is not an ear splitting noise in our terms, uh, a moderate noise exposure can cause the loss of these synapses that then can persist later in life and lead to hearing loss that uh, we can only report in certain contexts. Um, so this again raises the concern that we should be doing something uh, different in terms of how we advise young people. Um, there has been a significant increase in uh, teenagers in terms of their hearing loss, at least those that have been tested. It's, the real number is expected to be much higher. Um, and so the 60-60 rule is one that we try to enforce that, um, that individuals are, should experience no more than 60 minutes on their uh, iPod uh, at no more than 60% volume. And there are now, uh, I, I believe, apps that will kind of monitor your hearing exposure and automatically adjust uh, the volume on your phone. Uh, the second uh, strategy is to use noise canceling headphones, which despite their expense uh, can be thought of as a really important investment in your hearing in that they limit the outside sounds so that you don't have to turn up the volume so much on your hearing device. So the take home for today is that uh, we have a remarkable structure within our ears, uh, these hair cells that are highly specialized with lots of components that, such as ion channels that allow them to convert mechanical stimuli into a neural code that we ultimately interpret as music or speech. Cochlear implants, uh, as much as they have been a godsend to many patients suffering from hearing loss, they do restore hearing perception, uh, but they uh, definitely are in need of improvement in, in order to uh, simulate in a realistic sense, music and speech perception. Uh, hearing loss is very heterogeneous and uh, there are many causes that come together ultimately to determine uh, what, how we hear. And so it's often a task of the otolaryngologist uh, in order to make sense of any new development in terms of loss of hearing. And the take home big message, especially on this uh, 4th of July weekend is to practice safe listening, to make sure that uh, if you're in the vicinity of fireworks that you're far enough away that you don't need to use protective hearing uh, equipment. And if you are right up close and personal to the fireworks, um, my message is to think twice. So uh, with that, I think it's time for uh, bringing back the, uh, or introducing the panel. Um, with, uh, I guess I'll introduce uh, Dr. Spencer Smith first. So uh, Dr. Smith is an assistant professor in the Department of Speech, Language and Hearing Sciences. Um, Eric Senning is an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience. And Nace Golding is a professor in the Department of Neuroscience. And each one of them have expertise in some aspect of, of what I've just told you and more. So feel free to uh, ask away in the, the chat, which I, I believe we'll be able to see in a moment. And uh, Dr. Malk is going to be moderating those questions. Great, I'll, I'll do the questions. and. Just as a reminder, keep typing them in. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. So thank you to Amy for that great thing. And so uh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just want to start with this question for, I don't know, obvious uh, personal reasons. There's a question that says, uh, any relationship between hearing loss and hair loss? <laughs> asking, asking for a friend. <laughs> I, uh, I am not aware of any relation between the two. 
Okay, that, that, that was a real question, but it was uh, for our humor to get started. So uh, there's an interesting question about uh, uh, cochlear implants, implantation. How do, it says, how did the cells end up? But I think it meant, how do the electrodes end up in the right places within the cochlea? So um, I will answer that question um, in that my colleague, Marlon Hansen, has an entire company that is dedicated to improving the placement of the electrodes. Um, it's a very delicate process, particularly in pediatric patients and relies on extremely experienced hands. So what Dr. Hansen has devised is technology, robotic technology, um, in order to insert the electrodes in a very um, consistent fashion between patients and in a way that uh, is somewhat personalized uh, because as you can imagine, uh, each individual may have uh, a different type of structural impediment within their cochlea. Um, and so it's very exciting to think that um, just as in other aspects of, of um, let's say cardiac um, procedures, there will be a procedure uh, for a robot to systematically implant the electrode with the least amount of damage to the neurosensory structures. Great. Uh, here's a question from one of our longtime regulars, uh, Joe uh, Virgil, who I think has been to every brainstorm and often asks a question. Uh, I think her question's related to the uh, dinner party syndrome that maybe we'll talk about. So she, sa she says that as, as she and her friends have aged, um, they've noticed that it's harder to understand other accents, such as strong British accents. So is this related to the dinner party syndrome? dinner party syndrome where it's hard to understand given noisy backgrounds? Yeah, I would um, just jump in and say that in addition to some of the changes um, in the periphery in the inner ear that Dr. Lee um, mentioned in her talk, as we age, one thing that happens higher up in the brain is that um, the inhibitory circuits that are normally sort of fine tuning how the auditory system um, shifts attention and learns what is, uh, what is novel or, or learns online um, deteriorates to some extent. That's been shown um, in animal models that inhibition decreases as a function of age. Um, and so it's probably multifactorial. It's probably a mix of some loss of function in the inner ear um, as, we, as we just um, heard a lot about. And the um, uh, lower degree of neuroplasticity and lower degree of um, inhibitory power to be able to kind of filter what we want to hear, learn new things online. That's probably all uh, culminating in this, um, this lower adaptability to new accents, for example. Great. So uh, Acknowledging that we aren't physicians and we're gonna get some questions, some medically related questions and we'll, we'll dodge as many of those as we can. Um, but there, there, I'm gonna to link together two questions. One is, and my French is poor, uh, uh, how does this relate to Meniere's disease? And there's another one about the relationship between neurofibromatosis and uh, hair cell loss. So uh, anybody know anything about the relationship to hair loss, uh, hair cell loss and some of these other um, disorders? I can talk a little bit about Meniere's disease and that the problem with that disease is that it, it's actually a disease of pressure. So there's a fluid that's in, in the cochlea and through various um, mechanisms, it can have too much of it, produce too much fluid and it can cause pressure. Uh, and, and because some of the symptoms of Meniere's disease, it can be both auditory as well as balance related issues because our vestibular system, which gives us balance and control, also has a hair cell-like system that is very similar to um, the, what uh, Dr. Lee described in her talk. And so when there's pressure pushing on uh, these things, we can have vestibular imbalances, which makes, leads to dizziness and um, nausea, and uh, as well as um, auditory 
problems as well because the whole mechanotransduction now there there's fluid that is now pushing on the auditory apparatus in unusual ways. I'm gonna jump in with a curious question here. I know that I'm mostly concerned about the small channels, but in terms of the pressure in that in the cochlea, when these probes are inserted, um, these cochlear implant probes. How do they maintain that when you insert this, that that lymphatic fluid doesn't go everywhere? Does anyone know the answer to that? I'm just curious how that works. <laughs> I think surgeons will normally uh, also include a little bit of fascia around the electrode that they graft from another part of the body um, or, or some synthetic grafting material to try to provide or reseal um, the cochlea. From my understanding, there is a little bit of a, a leak through that new fistula when they, when they poke a hole into the cochlea. Most of the time, it's not um, so detrimental that, um, that the entire you know, inner ear fluid leaks out of the, of the, um, of the system. Um, that's part of the reason why, even though you know, there, there's an electrode going into the auditory portion of the inner ear, uh, patients with cochlear implants can sometimes complain of balance problems because they lose fluid from the, uh, the balance system in the inner ear also, but it's not to the point that it completely um, drains the, the um, inner ear through the, through the opening. I'll add quickly that Meniere's disease has a, a visual system equivalent, which is maybe more familiar to many of us, which is glaucoma. And that has to do also with too much fluid and pressure. Does that pressure come from an imbalance of the potassium or something? Or like one of the, the ions that's accumulating in there? Does anyone? Uh, it, Here's my like, ion many, channel question, right? I'm problems. thinking about ions. <laughs> yeah, I believe there is uh, an inherited um, mutation that is thought to affect one of the ion transporters that um, the data are still out, but um, seems to be important for maintaining the composition uh, of the cochlear fluids. There's one, one more thing. Um, I think part of that question was about neurofibromatosis type two and full disclosure, I'm not a physician, uh, but, I, but I am a clinical audiologist and, and I've seen patients with um, NF2. And the issue with that is, um, is actually beyond the level of the cochlea or beyond the level of the inner ear in most cases. And it's um, um, the difficulty or the hearing loss associated with it is due to tumor growths off of the auditory nerve as opposed to um, damage actually to the inner ear. And so for those patients, cochlear implants can be challenging because the hearing loss is coming from damage to the auditory nerve and the cochlear implant essentially bypasses all of the auditory system leading to the auditory nerve. Um, so there have been patients with NF2 implanted what, with what are called um, cochlear nucleus uh, or brainstem implants uh, to bypass the auditory nerve. Okay, so here's a question from Ty385. Do we know any regulatory pathways at the level of these mechanoreceptors? I feel like most auditory sensory regulation I've heard of have much more to do with upstream processing. Ace, I can let you start that one. Uh, I'm not sure about regulatory pathways for the mechanosensitive channels. Did I hear that correctly? I think so, yeah. So I, I think that maybe like some part of the adaptation for the ion channels. I honestly don't know very much about these ion channels in um, the hair cells. Um, it's such a specialized system that people who work on hair cell ion channels, they are their own troop. And um, it's such a very delicate preparation to get out and do these experiments that that's all you study. <laughs> but um, as I'm certainly true that there will be many regulatory pathways for any ion channel that, that you can that you can name. I mean, calcium is a big part of um, the way that these channels um, adapt, right? I, I don't know the details of that exactly. Yeah, so one of the processes is, is that calcium can regulate the tip links. I think early on in her talking, Dr. Lee um, 
showed these little connections between the, the, the little bristles that are on the top of the hair cells that sort of link them together and their s stiffness and, and how much they pull can be adjusted depending on um, a lot of regulatory pathways and, and those pathways can be adjusted by the flux of an ion called calcium inside of the hair cell. And that one other, calcium um, comes in through activity. One other factoid that seems to be emerging and is common to a lot of ion channels, such as those that Dr. Senning and I study is that there seem to be multiple subunits. Um, it's not just the product of the TMC gene, but also an accompanying TMIE factor that interacts with the, the channel and modifies its function. And um, certainly calcium is an important feedback regulator of all, a lot of ion channels, um, but I I'm, don't believe it's known exactly how um, calcium regulates this one in particular. One of the, the coolest stories I know about in terms of the ion channels is that there's two genes, right? TMC1 and TMC2. And that during development, um, maybe someone can chime in about this. There's a, a switchover in the roles that one becomes more prominent as you age. Is that true or, or am I not, I'm not quite sure? A... I don't know uh, about the details, but I think having two genes encoding a similar product has been part of what's been um, hindering progress in identifying some of these channels. Um, but I think redundancy is a common theme that we seem to encounter among ion channels. So there, there's a question that uh, mentions that you mentioned the current gold standard for, uh, for uh, implants and hearing aids. So the question is what devices are in our future? It seems like hearing aid technology and, and presumably uh, cochlear implant technology is rapidly advancing. So in, any speculation on what's coming? One, um, one strategy which seems far-fetched uh, for most people, but um, for us neuroscientists, is <laughs> seems rather mundane is optogenetics, um, which would uh, seem to be not very feasible in humans, but uh, my colleague in Germany, Tobias Moser, um, has used, uh, is approaching this as a, a possible alternative. Um, this is a strategy where one can use the viruses that I mentioned to introduce uh, certain molecules that are sensitive to light or chemicals um, in order to uh, stimulate the auditory nerve in a way that might uh, be similar to how a cochlear implant would work. I'm not exactly sure uh, about the benefits of that approach over the, the gold standard that we know, the cochlear implant, but um, I suppose it's an emerging technology. I can talk a little bit to that because the advantage of using light instead of these electric, you know, electrical impulses, I would make the analogy of trying to play the piano with a stiff mitten, right? You can't help but hit the neighboring keys. And that's the problem with cochlear implants is that the electrical impulses spill over and they activate frequencies that, you, that are neighboring, but not the ones you're trying to stimulate. So the idea with using light to activate some molecules that you've introduced to the cochlea is that it, you can actually focus it really finely and so that you can get that precision so that when you want to stimulate eight kilohertz region, that's all you stimulate. Um, it's still very much in, in well, only in animal models, of course. And um, the problem with light is that it also tends to heat things up um, if you um, stimulate a lot. And so now one of the experiments that are going on in animals is actually to use a little bit of a hybrid system using both light as well as electrical activity, maybe interspersing them so that you don't get the heating, but you get the, some of the precision from the light. I think on the technology side as well, um, we are, especially with Bluetooth technology, um, you know, emerging within the last uh, decade and clinical equipment, um, 
that allows hearing aids uh, between ears to speak to one another, hearing aids and cochlear implants to speak to one another. And so the coordination uh, between devices that a, that a single patient may wear on his or her head um, is getting better. And that's really important for restoring binaural hearing because we know that binaural hearing are using two ears um, is one of the main driving forces that allows us to hear where things are in space and separate out different sound sources. So the technology is, is getting better at communicating. Um, and lastly, I would just add that there are research groups that are looking at um, how the brain can actually modulate how a hearing aid, um, and in the future, I'm sure this will pertain to cochlear implants as well, how the brain can modulate um, how a hearing aid is working. So hearing aids are really good at picking out picking up speech and amplifying speech. The problem is they don't know what speech is important and what speech is not. So if you're sitting at a restaurant and you want to listen to the person directly in front of you or 45 degrees to your right, for example, um, the hearing aid uh, kind of senses all speech within that general area as being important and, and amplifies it. Um, if we add neuromodulation to hearing aids, in other words, if we are able to measure what the brain wants to listen to, and use that information to direct where hearing aids are listening, then that uh, presumably adding that cognitive piece will, um, will improve how hearing aids work and not make them uh, so dumb in the sense that <laughs> they're, they're listening to all speech that's coming in and not selectively filtering out important speech versus non-important speech. So here's a question from Scott. It's a fun one about reaction time. So is the reaction time associated with auditory stimuli primarily due to this mechanical transduction or is it in the time for the brain to interpret the input? Well, I think I can take an initial stab and others can chime in, but the hair cells are incredibly fast. So probably your per the perception of the time that it takes for sounds to take place is probably more to do with all the brain activity that's going on rather than the transduction of the initial sound in the, um, in the ear. Yeah, I guess it depends on what you mean by reaction time. We know that there are reflex circuits initiated in the auditory brainstem that are um, engaged within the first 10 milliseconds or so of a sound being presented. Um, anything that requires uh, cognitive appraisal or interpretation of sound obviously will take longer. Yeah, I think the, certainly compared to the visual system, the auditory system is very fast. Yeah. So uh, here, here's a great question about tinnitus. So is tinnitus the product of the absence of input to the central nervous system or does it originate in the peripheral nervous system? The answer is yes. So it's, tinnitus is a little bit like epilepsy in that there, it's just a phenomenon with probably many different causes. So some causes can originate in the cochlea, but actually many forms of tinnitus are centrally derived. Um, for example, um, there are some patients that have to have surgery on um, something called an acoustic um, uh, melanoma, and it can result in severing the auditory nerve. And often that can actually induce symptoms of tinnitus, even though now the brain is actually cut off from the uh, cochlea. So you can think of it as sort of equivalent to like a phantom limb. You get this, now the brain is now hyperactive and generating the activity that would normally be produced by sounds, even though the brain is actually disconnected from the transduction apparatus that would actually provide the electrical activity to the brain from those sounds. So yeah, there are many different causes and that is actually why it has been extremely difficult um, to follow up research on the mechanisms of tinnitus, because like epilepsy, there are lots of different causes and probably no single mechanism that is responsible for it. So the um, solutions have, really have to be individualized to the, the person. So here's a question about hearing loss, which uh, is important given uh, 
everything that Amy talked about. So uh, you mentioned how uh, high frequency hearing loss is particularly uh, sensitive to loud noises and such. Uh, what can cause hearing loss for lower frequencies? We've actually already talked about one of these um, and that's Meniere's disease. Um, so going back to what was discussed earlier, Meniere's disease comes from an overproduction of endolymph. And so the fluid that's in the inner ear um, is not regulated as efficiently as it should be. And the first place that that impacts in the cochlea is the apex where Dr. Lee was talking about low frequency sounds being encoded. And the reason is that when you increase fluid pressure, the first thing to give, the first place to move is the floppy um, kind of larger portion of the basilar membrane that, that is uh, heavier and therefore vibrates at lower pitches. Um, so one characteristic of Meniere's disease is low frequency hearing loss or low pitch hearing loss. And it tends to fluctuate as a consequence of um, how much endolymph pressure is in the inner ear. So when someone is having an active Meniere's disease spell, they will have poorer low pitch hearing. When that spell um, is remediated either by lowering uh, sodium in the diet, for example, or through surgery or through medications, um, generally it's possible to rescue some of that low frequency hearing loss because if you can remove some of that extra fluid, that distended portion of the inner ear tuned to low frequencies returns back to its normal uh, state. Very good. Uh, by, by the way, I forgot, I, I have a complaint to, uh, to uh, Amy. Uh, I, I, I wanna complain that you used me as an example of, as an older person for frequency loss. Although then I have to say that you mentioned, you said 13 kilohertz, I caught off about 12 kilohertz now. So uh, thank I you. think the verbiage was more experienced. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so I was the example of more experienced. I, I, I know what that's about. So. We're running out of time. And so what I, what I wanna do uh, so that each of our panelists uh, can uh, give them a chance to say something that perhaps they've wanted to say, we can't. So we're gonna call this lightning round. And in the lightning round, I'd like each of our panelists, including Amy, you have 30 seconds to tell us something, uh, tell us something about the auditory system or ion channels that you wanna tell us, but we haven't talked about so far. So who'd like to go first? I can go first. Um, so the ion channel that I didn't get to tell you more about uh, was the voltage gated calcium channel, which is the most critical ion channel, not only in hair cells, but throughout the nervous system. It's really their opening is the cells call to action to do something to either uh, transcribe genes or to uh, cause neurotransmitters to be released. Uh, they are the queen of ion channels and perhaps all molecules in the nervous system. <laughs> I was going to get mad at it, Dr. Lee, because that was the ion channel I was going to say um, is so great. It's, it couples voltage to, to calcium and calcium is, of course, such an important uh, signaling factor uh, in all sorts of different excitable cells. So that was also my top choice. But I am also um, particularly excited because the identity of the pore uh, for these mechanoreceptors has only recently become sort of more consensus uh, determined and that's this TMC1 and TMC2. And again, this is such a massive complex on the tips of these stereocilia and people are, are finding out more and more about how they function um, every day. So it's an exciting time to, to discover what these mechanoreceptors are doing on the tops of these stereocilia. And I think that they're gonna be important discoveries that relate to health um, and, and hearing loss that, that can be uh, determined through working with these. Well, I can add up my, my factoid is that we have two ears for a reason. And the, one of the major reasons why there, it's important to have two ears is to compare both the time and the intensity differences of sounds reaching the two ears. And we use that to determine where sounds are located and also to sort of make sense really helps us do that um, cocktail, solve that cocktail party effect to sort out by knowing where a sound's located, we can actually 
use our brains to filter out all the other stuff that we're not interested in. I know that's an interest of Spencer as well. Um, yeah, and I guess my uh, fun fact or, or something that excites me about uh, my field or our field is um, just like every other sensory system, the auditory system is, is highly plastic. And so a really exciting area of research to me um, is about trying to understand how to harness that plasticity to remediate some of the problems that we've talked about um, today. So um, for example, Dr. Lee mentioned that musicianship is, is um, something that her family uh, takes pride in. We know that music shapes the brain in positive ways. Um, and I'm interested in, in kind of understanding how those experiences and the neuroplastic changes associated with musicianship or other auditory training experiences um, can help us in the clinic in terms of, um, you know, getting patients to get the most out of their auditory systems and potentially remediating damage that's been done to their auditory systems. Um, and, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, well, thank you. So uh, let's wrap up by first thanking uh, our panelists, Dr. S Spencer Smith, Dr. Nace Golding, Dr. Eric Senning. Thank you so much. You guys did a great job. And of course, uh, a special thanks to Dr. Amy Lee, uh, number one, for a great presentation, and number two, for uh, agreeing to uh, saying yes to us recruiting you to UT Austin. Uh, and I suspect that uh, uh, each of you is going to be a part of a future brainstorms, and we look forward uh, to that. So thank you so much. Everybody's clapping. You can't hear it. I'm sorry, but everybody's clapping. Uh, but but uh, fantastic job, and thank you. And let, let's just close by uh, talking about upcoming, uh, upcoming brainstorms. Uh, we're uh, skipping July. Nobody wants to present in July, but we'll be, begin our fifth season of UT Brainstorms in August. Uh, I'll be doing it. Uh, we've uh, uh, gotten into the habit in the last few years of using the August brainstorms to talk about the neuroscience of learning and studying. It's a great time given the UT students are coming back on campus, high school students are ramping up. And so neuroscience and cognitive neuropsychology know a lot about uh, how we learn with implications for how we should teach and how we should study. Uh, and that's what we'll be talking about uh, uh, Thursday, uh, August 26th, same time, same spot. So with that, thanks again to Dr. Lee, thanks to the panelists, thanks to you for uh, your continued support. Uh, as we always say, we'll keep doing these as long as uh, people keep showing up. Don't forget that you can visit utbrainstorms.com. We have our, uh, what's it called? We have our own channel, UT Brainstorms, where you can see all but I think three of the previous brainstorms. You can see videos of them. So you could spend, you, you could spend the weekend uh, binge watching all, all of the brainstorms. So with that, thank you. Uh, thanks again to our presenters and we'll see you next time. Good night.